welcome to Tata Katha, a new show from the Banyan Tree. Now, if you are an old subscriber, you would you must be wondering why a separate show on Tata's, given the fact we already have a show on the best-selling books, specifically business books, and given the fact there are already so many books on Tata's. And this is exactly why we need a separate show. The House of Tata's, the holding company, the group companies, the brands, the history, the socio-economic factors, and most importantly, the people themselves are so vast and so deep that they need a separate dedicated series. And a separate show for this, for Tata's, was only a natural you know, extension. I'll tell you a bit more about the format of the show. The Banyan Tree itself was born to quench our thirst to, to resolve our curiosity for behind the scene, the lesser known stories. And this Tata Katha, as the name itself suggests, hopes to bring forth the lesser known stories, the anecdotes from the House of Tata's in a format you might have never or rarely heard of them. And the series itself uh, would come in season wise. In each season, we would be having a stalwart, a historian, an author, or a veteran of the Tata group who might be taking on different aspects. And uh, it would come in a package of five to six mini episodes contained in a single series. The first series, we are honored to have Dr. Shashank Shah. He is an acclaimed author of the book, The Tata Group from Torchbearers to Trailblazers. After completing his MBA, Dr. Shah uh, pursued his academic research in corporate responsibility and inclusive business strategies from HBS, Harvard Business School. And followed by that, he was also a South Asian Institute Fellow at the Harvard University. He, uh, he is a keynote author and, spe uh, and speaker at multiple universities across India and beyond. As of now, he also works as the consulting editor for the Business India Group. Now, ho hosting a show on Tata itself requires a lot of knowledge. And for the very fact, we have with us Mr. Kirish Avali. Mr. Kirish Avali is, you can say, one of the veteran fans of the Tata Group and a Tata, Tata enthusiast and a keen observer himself. He's also the CEO of South Asian Ag Tech Hub for Innovation. And uh, we are extremely honored to have Girish uh, hosting this particular show. Over to you, uh, Mr. Girish Avali and Dr. Shashanksha. Thank you very much for the introduction, Saurabhdi. It's a pleasure being here. Hello, viewers. Welcome to Banyan Tree and to this episode of Tata Katha, where we are going to discuss Tata's in leadership with Dr. Shishank Shah, the celebrated and renowned author of the Tata Group. Uh, the Tatas have been uh, very pioneering people at the helm, and Shishank has written a very lovely book on them. Uh, Shishank, welcome to this episode. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Girish. So like I was saying that the Tatas have had very pioneering people who have led the group uh, and we are well aware and have read extensively on Jamsheji Tata, J.R.D. Tata and Ratan Tata. But I somehow feel that the legacy of Sir Dorab Tata has not found the place that he deserves in contemporary literature. Uh, I feel that his work in bringing to life the vision of Jamsheji Tata as well as to adding width to the Tata group has somehow not been uh, extremely well covered in modern day literature as well as in magazines and newspapers. So I wanted to know Shishang that what are your views on this? Uh, because uh, from whatever I have read and the way I assess it, I feel that uh, Sir Dorab Tata's contribution has been exemplary. Your views please Shishang. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirish. Uh, thank you, Saurudhi, first for that uh, uh, warm introduction. Uh, I must appreciate Banyan Tree and uh, your team for uh, initiating this series uh, called Tata Katha. Uh, the word Katha itself uh, is of Indian origin, which says uh, that you're narrating a story, a story of something very grandiose. Uh, we usually use it uh, for our epics. Uh, in fact, the famous Mahabharata serial also starts with that uh, wording, Athashri Mahabharata Katha. So it's such a grand epic that it deserves to be told with all detail and hence it's a Katha format. And similarly, in the case of the Tata group, uh, because they've been around for 150 years, uh, uh, that's uh, not a short span of time uh, from any lens. Uh, so that kind of uh, uh, multi-part uh, discussion on the Tata group, the lessons that uh, we can learn as managers, as entrepreneurs, as researchers, scholars, and even plainly as uh, avid observers and admirers of the way Tata leaders take decisions uh, is, uh, is very important, especially in the current times. And I'd like to say this uh, because most of our business schools 
teach examples and case studies uh, which are of western companies uh, we take uh, uh, case studies and uh, strategy discussions based on uh, what conglomerates from other parts of the world have done and what they have not done well what they have done well and how we can dovetail our strategies of benchmark our approaches or processes based on their experience uh, but i think uh, times are changing and it's very important to uh, learn from our own experience of uh, con conglomerates of companies uh, that have done extremely well for themselves in india in different time periods uh, in the tata group itself and because girish mentioned about my book uh, i've covered uh, the tata story across three time periods uh, we have the victorian era uh, the british raj uh, and started under queen victoria of england uh, and then we have the post independence era uh, which was quite often called the license raj uh, where we had a lot of centralization etc and then the third is uh, the post globalization era or rather the post liberalization era uh, which is often called as the billionaire raj uh, because of the acute uh, socio economic inequities that india is facing uh, despite doing so well for itself uh, so there is so much to learn within this country and its experience in the corporate space and hence uh, uh, my whole uh, inspiration of writing about the tatas was from this particular mindset that there is so much to learn from our own people and our own companies and who better to start with uh, than the tata group of course the tata group is a third is my third book uh, but yes in terms of an elaborate uh, study on a particular group that's the only of its kind in my in in terms of my writings uh, so that's a brief uh, into why uh, the tata group uh, should be studied or needs to be studied or for that matter any of the larger corporations uh, uh, especially the historic ones which played a role across time periods uh, coming back to your question girish so i think uh, I'm reminded of a similar conversation I had with the head of the uh, Tata Central Archives in Pune. I visited several places in order to uh, get insights about the Tata Group and the way they take decisions and uh, several historic fact files about uh, uh, the, the the iconic Tata companies. So, at the Tata Central Archives, uh, the head of the archives, uh, uh, while we were uh, discussing about what my book is going to cover and the kind of interviews I have done, almost hundred plus. across the senior leaders of tata group companies uh, and my visit visits to several places uh, uh, whether it's uh, jamshedpur pune bangalore mumbai and more so uh, he said uh, uh, ensure one thing i said what he said exactly what girish said a lot of uh, details are available on the work uh, that jamshed ji tata has done that grd tata has done and of course that mr ratan tata has done but very uh, little amount of literature is available or very little coverage is usually given to sir dorap tata uh, and his role uh, in nurturing uh, the tata group uh, during a very very unique period in history a uh, very few know uh, and very few realize uh, that he was the connecting link uh, for the tata group uh, from the 19th to the 20th century uh, in 1904 when uh, jamshed ji tata uh, concluded his earthly sojourn it was his eldest son uh, dorap who took over the reins of the tata group and uh, became its chairman and headed the group for nearly 3 decades 28 years to be precise from 1904 to 1932 when he passed away and remember this is an era which is char char characterized by several world events uh, which are unprecedented world war 1 uh, uh you uh, uh, you see in india the uh, the picking up of the freedom struggle in substantial measure uh you have uh, the post world war impact on several economies of the world and of course you have the great depression which set to, which was setting in when uh, uh, dorab ji passed away so right from 1904 to uh, 1932 dorab ji played a very important role in uh, what word should i use in nurturing this uh, this sapling which had or rather the seed which jamshed ji had sown and which had become quite a, a, a young sapling uh, to to make it into a fruit bearing tree i think the gardener has been dorab ji tata in fact it's a fascinating example for uh, entrepreneurs to learn from uh, sir dorab ji tata's life as to how a uh, family owned businesses uh, can be or should be managed uh, in multi generational context uh, because here was a father to son business which was passed on it was developed reasonably well by by uh, jamshed ji but it was taken to really phenomenal heights uh, by uh, his son uh, within three decades 
So let me just highlight some of the key contributions of uh, Sir Dorab Tata. Uh, so one of the first uh, uh, set of contributions that he made was uh, transforming the three dream projects of Jamsetji Tata into reality, uh, which were those three. Uh, of course, Tata Steel, uh, which had neared uh, completion in terms of searching for the right site where the Tata Steel plant, the future Tata Steel plant would be located. It wasn't finalized in Jamsetji's lifetime. It was after Jamsetji uh, that Sakchi, which is now Jamshedpur, was identified as the place where the Tata Steel plant was construct will be constructed. And the entire way in which the Tata plant was constructed, and we know of that uh, landmark letter which Jamsetji wrote to his son as to how the future a town of Tata Steel should be. That vision was translated into reality uh, by Jamsetji. Uh, in fact, Tata Steel became one of the first companies in India to be uh, uh, funded uh, purely by Swadeshi capital, uh, because in those years, uh, the investors from Britain uh, wanted more control over a fledgling enterprise in India. And hence, uh, they weren't that forthcoming. And all the investments in Tata Steel was made by our own Indian investors. A uh, similar is the case with Tata Power. Uh, Jamsetji had a vision uh, to generate power for Mumbai through hydroelectricity several decades uh, before he left, but the permissions were not coming in. It was Dorab Tata again who put into uh, place the entire plan for Tata Power and executed it and uh, provided uh, clean electricity to the uh, city of Mumbai, very dear to his father uh, within a decade after his demise. And the third, of course, is uh, Jamsetji's uh, dream project, the Indian Institute of Science, the inspiration for which uh, is said was received from Swami Vivekananda uh, during uh, a, a journey uh, with him on ship. And uh, the Indian Institute of Science was also one of Jamsetji's uh, dearest projects, but it wasn't uh, getting approval from the British government. In fact, Lord Curzon, uh, then Governor General, uh, was not uh, quite satisfied with the uh, promise and potential of the Institute of Science, as in what will be, what will the graduates uh, from this institute do? Uh, there aren't that kind of jobs available in India. But it was to Jamsetji's, uh, it was to Dorabji's credit uh, that Indian Institute of Science finally saw the light of day. And uh, today it's India's the finest university in several uh, rank, uh, ranking, uh, 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 several ranking uh, profiles which come out every year. So this is one very important contribution of the Rabji. Tata Steel, Tata Power, in Institute of Science, dreams of Jamsetji, visions, ideas laid forth very clearly, funding provided to a large extent, delivered, executed by the sun. Second part I'd like to share is about uh, all the new companies uh, that the Rabji uh, established. Uh, I think uh, the listeners uh, would, uh, would be benefited uh, if they study more about the Rabji and a lot of material is available, uh, though not as popular uh, because, of, uh, because of the reason why Girish asked that question. Uh, you, it's very important to note that uh, Dorabji inherited uh, not only the leadership of the Tata companies, but he also inherited uh, the industrial genius of his father and also the risk taking abilities, very important uh, in the field of entrepreneurship because profits are a uh, a remuneration you receive for taking the right kind of risks. So in the post Jamsetji era, Dorabji embarked on several enterprises, several new industries. Uh, for example, the Indian Cement Company, uh, which he established in 1912, was the first successful attempt at producing cement in India. Uh, the Tata Construction Company uh, dented uh, British monopoly in massive infrastructure projects in India. Uh, for example, it was the Tata Construction Company uh, which constructed or uh, built the Vaitarana Dam and uh, several railway bridges uh, over the Sindhu River, which is the Indus or the, Gang, or the Godavari or the Krishna or the Narmada. All of these were constructed uh, by the Tata Construction Company in the 1910s and early 1920s. Uh, the Tata Industrial Bank was uh, the first of its kind uh, in India, established in 1917 because it was started with the objective of developing industrial resources of the country by Swadeshi capital and for starting manufacturing industries in India uh, from raw materials obtained within India. Another company, the New India Assurance Company, uh, provided uh, services in general and life insurance. All of these were started uh, by the Rabji Tata. 
uh, the Indian insurance company, a new India insurance company was started in 1919. And it went on to become uh, the largest composite Indian assurance company uh, that transacted all classes of insurance business and had a pan Indian distribution network and even had interestingly branches in the Middle East and the Far East. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, Dharabji ended up starting a dozen companies in his time. Uh, and uh, uh, it's important to note that even uh, the Bombay house, which has been synonymous with Tata Sons for the last 100 years, uh, was inaugurated in 1924 in the time of uh, Dharabji Tata. So a dozen companies, the Tata headquarters, all of this came up uh, in uh, Dharabji's time. But there were also a lot of challenges. Uh, the group realized, uh, especially in the post-war, that uh, uh, they had entered several new companies that were not aligned to the group's core competence. Uh, while they performed well uh, during the war years, uh, but they came crashing down in the post-war years. And that's when, uh, despite the best efforts to retain them, uh, the Tata's had to divest uh, most of them to remain afloat. Uh, so the Tata Industrial Bank was merged with the Central Bank of India. Uh, and uh, Tata Construction was acquired by the eminent industrialist Walchan Hirachan. Uh, for those of you who are from Mumbai, uh, you'd see that the Central Bank of India headquarters, the erstwhile headquarters, are exactly diametrically opposite uh, to Bombay House. So, because the, that building was the Tata Industrial Bank building and it belonged to the Tatas, and that's why the proximity uh, to the headquarters. In fact, uh, there was a time when uh, Tata Sons was even forced to sell half of the managing agency firm running Tata Power to an American company for a 21 year period, uh, which was not much appreciated by the nationalist minded uh, citizens of those years, especially when India was fighting for its struggle. A very important point I'd like to highlight is about uh, Dharabji's personal sacrifice and commitment to ensure that the institutions his father had envisioned uh, survived the test of time. And uh, the finest hour of his leadership came uh, when Tata Steel was in real tough times. In fact, it was uh, recommended that Tata Steel should be sold off. And R.D. Tata, one of the four founding uh, members of Tata Sons, had said that that will happen only over my dead body. And what was the reason for Tata Steel seeing tough times? Uh, that was because uh, Tata Steel preferred to help the British government uh, during the war years as a matter of duty in a time of crisis. But in the post uh, and, and in the process, they let go a lot of profitable ventures for themselves. But in the post-war years, uh, the Indian British government uh, opened up the market and there was immense international steel dumping that was happening. And Tata Steel had to compete with uh, international steel dumping uh, when its machines uh, had uh, been overutilized uh, during the war years. So they were in real tough times and they didn't even have money to pay wages. Uh, it was that time that Dharabji mortgaged his personal wealth, his wife's jewelry, including the celebrated Jubilee diamond, which is larger than the Kohinu, for a loan of one crore rupees uh, from the Imperial Bank of India, which is now the State Bank of India, uh, so that he could pay the wages of the Tata Steel workers. I think uh, this is a very fine example of what it takes and what has been done in the Indian context by some fine leaders in order to nurture and ensure the continuation of their uh, corporations, even if it means personal losses. In today's time, uh, uh, we have examples of entrepreneurs who, when the companies uh, see tough times, face tough times, they uh, they pack their bags and uh, go to uh, geographies uh, from which uh, they cannot be brought back into India. But Dorabji was not that kind. He mortgaged his wife's jewelry. A very, very important example and a very important decision in his lifetime. And lastly, I'd like to highlight about his contribution on the social side. Uh, because at Tata's, uh, we always have a social side to every decision. Of course, all the others uh, which we spoke about were social decisions. But here, very tangibly, uh, Dorabji, who died childless uh, in 1932, he pledged a corpus of one crore rupees uh, that included all his belongings, uh, including his pearl studded uh, tie pin, uh, to Sir Dorabji Tata Trust uh, with the mandate to support higher learning and alleviating poverty. 
uh, and it was thanks to his munificence uh, that the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, which is credited as Asia's oldest institute for professional social work, uh, came up. It was also thanks to his munificence uh, that the Tata Memorial Hospital, India's first and one of the world's best equipped cancer care hospital was established. Uh, the, uh, the SDTT, as, as they say, the Sir Dorabji Tata Trust, continue to contribute to the lives of lakhs of Indians over the last uh, 80 years uh, in areas as diverse uh, 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 under education, uh, poverty alleviation, healthcare, and societal well-being. Uh, so the contribution which Dorabji made has been immense. And uh, some of these examples which I've shared uh, ind indicate uh, the, the impact that they've had in the later years of the Tata group. Thank you so much, Shashank. Uh, while as I knew some part of it, this really has been an education for me. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't know a lot of these things, especially on the cement part and on the uh, on the banking sector and that the, the Tatas were there. Uh, so it is well known that uh, Sir Dorab Tata did institutionalize the Tata trusts. But other aspects that you mentioned are uh, really an eye opener. One and second, I must also confess that uh, while as Jamshedji Tata had the vision. I think the execution skills that Sir Dorab Tata brought to the fore of the Tata Group, and that too at a time when we were not an independent country, where but we're still uh, being ruled by the Britishers, uh, speaks volumes of the commitment of this man to realizing his father's dreams. Thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. Uh, so Shashank, in my growing up years, one would read extensively on uh, great Tata leaders and managers like Rossi Modi, Ajit Kerkar, Sumant Mulgaonkar, FC Kohli, Mr. Ramadurai. Mr. Nani Palkewala. But of late, I have seen that uh, most of the Tata leaders are not uh, covered uh, very much by the media. It can be a case of uh, journalism negligence. It can be a case of media indifference. Uh, what do you really think is happening here? So on a lighter note, uh, this is quite an indication to Bombay House uh, to be uh, ensuring that there are more and more names of uh, corporate leaders within the Tata ecosystem getting featured in mainstream media uh, so that their presence and contribution and decisions and leadership uh, gets highlighted uh, sufficiently. Uh, but that's on a lighter note. There's a need to see this in the context of uh, the transition of leadership uh, from GRD Tata to Ratan Tata as the chairman of Tata Sons in 1991, uh, where there has been a conscious reversal uh, from the decentralized company level decision making structure uh, of Tata Sons to more group-centric structure. And uh, there are several reasons for this. And let me take the viewers uh, through what is the reason why uh, the kind of autonomy that was enjoyed in the JRD years and the kind of uh, quote-unquote satraps that emerged under JRD's leadership uh, wasn't the case uh, after Ratan Tata took over. Uh, so when uh, Tata Sons was uh, under Ratan Tata, uh, he inherited uh, what was then India's uh, largest business house uh, with almost 84 companies. And in 1991, uh, Tata's had a turnover of about 24,000 crores and profits of about 2,000 plus crores. Uh, when we see this uh, compared to what it is today, it appears extremely insignificant. But that was a lot of money in those years. Uh, and he inherited also uh, two key legacies. One, of course, uh, was a group that was high on ideals, was high on ethics and values. Uh, and the second legacy, in his own words, uh, and I'm not quoting him, but uh, sharing the essence of what he had mentioned in some of the interviews then, he said he had inherited a group uh, that had a board of directors where several of its members were in their 80s. Uh, many of them were unable to even walk unassisted into the boardroom. Some of them were hard of hearing. Uh, but whenever there was a proposal for any kind of change, all of them got together and refused to bring about any change. Uh, and that was the kind of situation where uh, Ratan Tata found himself. The former legacy with respect to values uh, was a strength uh, that needed to be upheld and nurtured. But the latter, which was about uh, a very aged uh, composition of the board of directors, was an area of concern uh, that needed to be rectified at the earliest uh, so that the group can bring in greater dynamism and there can be a lot more youthful energy in the company leadership. So he brought about several key governance changes, and that's important to note. Uh, after taking over, he announced two key initiatives. Uh, one was uh, the revival. Uh, a revival, uh, keep, in, keep in mind, many people don't know this was in a situation earlier also, and Ratan Tata revived it 
of a much ignored uh, policy uh, that mandated retirement of executives uh, and managing directors at the age of 65 and of chairmen and companies at the age of 75. Uh, mind you, as I mentioned, the board of Tata Sons at that time had most of its directors who were 80 plus. Uh, as per the new scheme, that would not be possible. Uh, the second was uh, reviving the Tata tradition of the group chairman holding chairmanship in major Tata companies. Uh, this was to ensure greater alignment in operating companies vision, uh, the group vision, uh, an area that had witnessed severe lacunae in the 1980s uh, after, Dada, after JRD Tata uh, handed over the chairmanship of major Tata companies to independent chairmen. Uh, the names that you mentioned, uh, 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 Suman Mulgaukar or Rusi Modi and several others. Uh, the second initiative was also to increase uh, the group's ownership in several Tata companies through a rights issue. Uh, in the change scenario, uh, when uh, there were chances of multinational companies taking over, and mind you, we are talking about post-1991, where India had embarked on the liberalization uh, uh, journey. Uh, Ratan Tata believed that Tata Sons holding in its major companies should be more than symbolic. Uh, why is this important? Why do I say so? Uh, the listeners would be amused to note uh, that during JRD years, uh, the stake of the Birla group in Tata Steel was double the stake of Tata's in Tata Steel. Birla through Pilani Investments owned 6% of Tata Steel and Tata Sons owned just 3% of Tata Steel. And on the eve of every annual general annual board meeting, AGM, annual general meeting, uh, the Ganchandas Gansha, Birla or GD Birla assigned the proxy forms and sent them to JRD in advance, leaving the decisions to his discretion. Uh, that was the kind of uh, importance uh, JRD held in the larger Indian uh, economic space and the kind of trust a uh, senior corporate leaders had in him uh, because he had uh, nurtured and empowered every single leader within the group companies uh, during their formative years. Uh, each of the leaders uh, looked up to him. They were grateful to him. Uh, they revered him almost. And uh, this charismatic personality and power of GRD, the soft power, uh, this was the route through which uh, the Tatas were led uh, during the 70s and 80s. Uh, but Ratan Tata uh, was convinced that this was not sustainable because there can be only one JRD Tata. Uh, so he believed that a persona driven structure would not survive in a competitive economy. Uh, to beat this perception and effectively address the challenges, he believed there was an urgent need to change the structure where the group functioned as a cohesive entity, uh, which was proactive, which was agile, and which could meet market requirements in the post liberalization period and even beat competition uh, that was uh, posed by uh, international companies. And for this, he believed that an institutionalized approach to governance uh, that would last long beyond any leader's charisma and time period would be required. And this was also uh, important uh, from an existential imperative uh, because the free market economy that India was heading into uh, necessitated that most Tata companies should transition uh, uh, their focus uh, from being a product centric and uh, cost focused companies that they were to customer centric and profits focused. And for this, there was a need for Tata Sons to have greater ownership in Tata companies, have more centralized decision making, or rather decision where the uh, priorities of the Tata company and of Tata Sons are aligned. And there is greater group cohesion. Now, how did he do it? He did it in two ways. And it's very important to, uh, to note that because uh, we are seeing several large industries, uh, uh, with several large companies uh, in today's India diversifying in, in different areas and each of them catering to a different industry category. Uh, for example, Reliance Industries. Uh, for long years, Reliance Industries and its diverse businesses and in different industries have been under Reliance Industries Limited, one group company. But now we see that they are diversifying and making each of their businesses standalone the energy business, the retail business, the telecommunications business. A similar trend is seen even in uh, Larson and Tubro. We have them entering several newer businesses and have standalone companies, Larson and Tubro uh, Infotech, Larson and Tubro Finance, and then the newly acquired uh, uh, Mindtree Consulting, which is in the consulting space. How do uh, these 
companies ensure that there is greater group cohesion greater alignment with the group office and also the kind of agility that is difficult to come in such a complex setup so what ratan tata introduced was the tata business excellence model uh, which was inspired by the malcolm baldridge model of usa uh, and uh, it's now managed uh, for almost 25 years by what is the tata business excellence group a special unit under tata sons uh, whose whole objective is to look after the jrd qb award so the jrd qb award was introduced in memory as uh, as uh, 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 a gratitude uh, an offering uh, so to say uh, to the memory of uh, jrd's leadership uh, provided to the tata companies and the focus was on quality and tata business excellence model was meant to be the means through which companies would achieve or win uh, the jrd qb award and as a result the tata business excellence model uh, acted as the binding glue uh, for tata companies where each of them could have their own best practices but each of them could also indulge in a healthy competition through a lot of intra group benchmarking of best practices so that they can succeed in their own industry categories uh, by learning from their fellow companies within the conglomerate the second part of this cohesion exercise was the tata brand uh, this was an initiative he took up almost 6 years after becoming the chairman and that was the tata brand uh, related decision uh, till then Uh, the tata brand was identified in 15 to 20 different ways uh, each company was doing its own thing each company has its own version of uh, of the word tata or the way it uh, communicated its brand and uh, the group leadership realized that uh, this was not sustainable especially when uh, the tata group would have to fight a uh, global conglomerates entering indian markets and if, and if they did not have a unified identity it would uh, uh, it would play an important role Uh, or rather it would uh, it would dent the chances uh, of uh, of of a, a unified identity of a unified entity uh, which fought the competition so for this purpose uh, they put in place what was the brand equity and business promotion agreement uh, which was effected from around 1998 what was uh, an outcome of that uh, there was a uniform brand mark which was to be used across tata companies uh, the viewers would be uh, interested to uh, note that it took 18 months of intense engagement uh, with the british design agency uh, wolf ollins uh, after which came out the now popular stylized t uh, inside a blue oval uh, which is the selected logo for the tata brand and a single font used uh, for the tata name uh, t a t a with no dash across the a uh, that has come up be uh, because it was a contemporary identity they wanted to develop and both of these were launched in 1999 now it wasn't uh, a free for all it wasn't something that all tata companies could use what they brought in was a way to bring in greater commitment to the tata brand if you want to benefit from the tata brand you have to live up to certain guidelines that the tata brand uh, comes along with. and what was and, and for this each of the companies that would like to be using the tata brands within the tata ecosystem had to make an annual contribution uh, by subscribing uh, by the subscribing tata company to tata sons as part of what i called the uh, what is called the brand equity and business promotion agreement bebp uh, and based on the degree of association uh, that company had with the tata sons and what did the tata sons do uh, they used this income to nurture the brand uh, for the promotion of the brand for the protection of the brand uh interestingly uh, the bbp is considered as an unprecedented initiative in corporate india uh, perhaps even globally uh, because uh, the kind of uh, brand value governance practices uh, that tata sons has put into place are among the best in the world in fact the managing director of brand finance acknowledged this and he in fact said that there is hardly any global company that has institutionalized brand related practices like the tatas have done and it isn't a surprise uh, that in 2021 uh, the tata brand continues to be india's number one brand but what is more important is its valuation it is valued at 21 plus billion dollars which is a phenomenal valuation for a native brand uh, which has been nurtured over 150 years uh, i'll conclude uh, by uh, uh, alluding to what girish asked me 
what about uh, the new brand of leaders a new brand of tata company leaders uh, and whether they have made a mark for themselves and whether they are acknowledged or not uh, i'd like to highlight some who've done phenomenally well uh, in the ratan tata years uh, the first name which comes to me is bhaskar bhat uh, who served as the managing director of titan uh, from early 2000s uh, for over 15 years his role in making titan and especially tanish a superlative indian brand uh, can hardly be underemphasized uh, mr ramadurai and mr chandrashekharan uh, both took charge under ratan tata at, at the helm of affairs at tcs and they took tcs uh, to about 100 countries and expanded the company from 25000 employees to 425000 employees in just two decades again an example uh, without a parallel uh, the leadership of dr irani and mr muthuraman again during the ratan tata years can again be cannot be ignored because of the fact that tata steel became the lowest cost producer of steel in the world and they also won the deming grand prize uh, which is the highest award in the quality management space in the world uh, mr ravi kant again under ratan tata uh, uh, did phenomenally well for tata motors and of course uh, mr jamwal uh, who is heading tata industries Uh, again under mr ratan tata has been doing very well in nurturing entrepreneurship uh, within the tata ecosystem so all have done the, all of them have done very well but yes uh, the level of independence uh, the lack of cohesion and several other limitations of the earlier era uh, have been modified for obvious imperatives in the change scenario in india especially in the post liberalization years and in the highly globalized world economy Uh, that uh, Mr. Ratan Tata operated. Thank you, Shashank. And if I may also add, Mr. R. Mukundan for Tata Chemicals, right? Uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar for uh, Tata Tea, as well as Indian Hotel subsequently. Mr. Harish Bhatt for Tata Tea and uh, Tata Global Beverages. Exemplary managers, extremely uh, well covered by the media as well, and extremely yes. Yes. and a very great performances which have reflected in their stock prices as well. That's right. That's right. I. i will be mentioning about my interactions with most of them in uh, the subsequent parts of uh, tata katha uh, but yes uh, all of those names also come into the same category of leaders who've done very well for themselves and the companies in the ratan tata so speaking of leaders shashank how steadying an influence do you think that the tata administrative service has been to ensure continuity of the group's aspirations and values across the multiple companies in the group yeah the administrative service uh, that doesn't get discussed very often uh, in current times but uh, it's it has played a very important role historically for the tata group of course it's relevant even today and i'll cover both those aspects uh, let me talk first about its historical relevance uh, it was in late 1940s uh, that jrd conceived uh, the need uh, for such kind of an institution uh, which could attract uh, the best talent into the tata group uh, i'd like to give a lot of credit to jrd for his far sightedness at that young an age uh, in 1938 when he became the chairman of tata group he was just 33 uh, so we are talking about somebody who is in his uh, 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 mid 40s uh, who is thinking so much ahead of his time uh, in fact in 1956 uh, the tata administrative services uh, came into existence and it was a premier uh, cadre based career path within the tata group of companies it was modeled on the indian civil service uh, there is also a, a, a sub anecdote to do, to, uh, to, do, to uh, uh, with respect to this in fact when uh, jrd tata uh, took uh, uh, or rather when jrd tata was brought into the tata ecosystem as a young lad uh, who just come from england after completing class 12 his father had uh, put him under the charge of a retired a civil servant from the indian civil service a british person uh, who was uh, 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 taking care of uh, tata steel and uh, jrd was uh, his uh, uh, trainee he was under training with this gentleman and uh, his job was to look at every letter that went to this person and uh, he would also read that letter when it went Uh, out from his table so uh, while getting into his table and after he had made his notings and moving out of his table a jrd would uh, look at each of the letters and uh, he uh, confessed in later years that this had been a phenomenal amount of learning for him 
so he believed that uh, the indian civil service or the kind of uh, training that was provided uh, to those officers if a similar service was made available for the tata ecosystem it would serve in good stead for the group in the long term and uh, that is what has happened and what's been the priority of uh, of tas uh, for the last six decades uh, it was it has been to select and groom a uh, young managers and of course provide them opportunities for growth within the tata group so that they can be a valuable talent pool that can be tapped into by group companies and in a way create a leadership pipeline uh, tas is also very unique because it provides uh, a lifelong mobility across the group uh, for the task managers or the task officers as they are called in fact in those years grd's involvement with tas was immense uh, there were occasions where task managers uh, uh, could walk into the chairman's cabin and say uh, sir that i worked uh, with tata oil mills for 2 years and now i would like to gain experience in automobile and uh, grd tata would said why automobile why not making steel that's a better experience and then the chairman of the company and a task officer would engage in a conversation as to what is the best career path for that young tata manager so that's the kind of involvement and that's the kind of priority uh, that grd gave uh, to tas uh, even today uh, uh, 25 to 30 young graduates uh, from india's uh, premier business schools uh, join the tas program every year from almost 1500 applicants and uh, one of the key factors that makes tas one of the most popular programs uh, on business school campuses is that uh, uh, the tas officers have an opportunity at a very young age uh, to address issues uh, that are worrying a senior uh, leadership of tata companies and as a result what happens is they have an opportunity to think way beyond their years and uh, address issues which you get to deal with only when you are a cxo probably uh, this opportunity to deal with complex issues at a young age instills in them a sense of maturity and confidence uh, and they and they can as a result uh, take up leadership positions earlier on uh, you gave the example of uh, you mentioned of uh, mr mukundan who is the managing director of tata chemicals he is the youngest managing director within the tata ecosystem to take charge and he is a task officer in his early 40s Uh, he became uh, the managing director of tata chemicals which is quite an achievement and if this is possible of course it is his own talent and skills it's also because of the exposure that the tas program provides uh, over six decades uh, there have been several impressive uh, tas leaders among those who are still around and are known uh, mr krishna kumar who is the senior most tas alumni and has been serving the tata group for almost half a century uh, mr prakash telang was the chairman of tata hitachi uh, and uh, retired as the uh, managing director of tata motors uh, mr harish but uh, the brand custodian of tata group uh, mr mukundan uh, mr jamwal uh, the executive director of tata industries all of these uh, have come up uh, from the tas program and they are leading diverse functions diverse industries and diverse companies a uh, one change in the current scenario which doesn't make tas uh, the only talent uh, pipeline program for india is because of uh, the way the program is uh, structured uh, there is apparently a lack of a specialization in tas uh, probably like uh, uh, the indian uh, the ias or the ics uh, because most tas officers work across tata group companies uh, and they have expertise across functions and across industries uh, which gave them an edge in the earlier years Uh, where there was a need uh, for uh, more generalists uh, if you will uh, but the current scenario is uh, probably different uh, because uh, today people are looking for specialists a specialist may not be in term in terms of a particular function but specialist definitely in terms of a particular industry category uh, because uh, in most industries uh, several decades of experience within the ecosystem is what helps uh, candidates rise up the ladder uh, for example in tcs Uh, for the last 50 years all the ceos of tcs have risen from within the company uh, of course mr kohli was mr agarwala was the first uh, leader of tcs uh, and uh, then mr kohli came in in 1974 and ever since uh, mr kohli mr ramadurai uh, mr chandrashekar and mr rajesh gopinath all of them have risen up the ranks from within tcs uh, they have not had uh, any task related uh, a leadership uh, into the uh, the cxo level positions within tcs 
so i think tas today is a complementing uh, uh, a career program while several tata companies within the ecosystem have their own ways in which they nurture and promote talent uh, so it is definitely very relevant even today as a phenomenal history to it uh, but is not the only uh, leadership program within the tata yes indeed and i think uh, for professional managers uh, what makes a career path like tas interesting is the opportunity to to work across different functions as well as across different industries uh, usually what happens is you know you enter a company out of a business school and then uh, most probably you are stuck in the same industry or you are not able to move across industry then certainly not across functions and that to at an early age so when the tas i think you know you can be uh, in finance and tata steel then move into hr in uh, indian hotels and then from there move into Uh, let us say supply chain with tata motors so that kind of uh, mobility i think is uh, uh, is extremely uh, valuable for a, for a manager uh, but thank you so much for this uh, really appreciate your insights uh, shashank and thank you viewers for being with us for this episode of uh, tata kata uh, we shall be back soon with another uh, episode and far more interesting uh, episodes here after as well thank you so much thank you